Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the go-to podcast for investors and builders in crypto. And before we get started, just a reminder for you guys out there, the Block Crunch Podcast is intended for informational purposes only. Neither the host nor its guests are licensed financial advisors, and nothing discussed should be construed as financial advice. Views held by Block Crunch's guests are their own, and sponsorship messages do not constitute financial advice or endorsement. With that out of the way, let's jump right in. Today's episode is brought to you by Protocol Labs, the team behind Filecoin. And with me today is Colin Efren from Protocol Labs, who leads ecosystem there to tell us why people should choose Filecoin over alternatives. So Colin, why should people be using Filecoin over other competitors? Filecoin believes that Web3 will only win by offering a better product at a better price point. When it comes to storage, Filecoin offers the most scale at the cheapest price with the strong guarantees, uniquely enabled by its open market of storage providers and its crypto economic incentives. Now, smart contracts on Filecoin, which launches in Q1 of 2023, only make this more powerful. It enables users to create perpetual storage deals to store data forever at costs that are a small fraction of centralized storage providers, I guess. Hello there. Now, before we move on, I'd love to thank the hundreds of you who have subscribed to Blockrunch VIP because with your support, I've been able to share my real thoughts on specific projects that I don't usually share on interviews in a format that I enjoy more, which is by weekly written posts. We've also been able to offer exclusive AMAs, sharing my investment frameworks, interactable models, and breaking down important trends before they become big. Now, we even had Elon Musk comment on one of our threads recently. So if you haven't already, head on over to theblockrunch.com slash VIP, and you can access dozens of hours of research for what you'd spend on a coffee a day. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. Now, as you know, we've been diving deeper into AI and crypto and its intersection. Uh, and we recently did an episode with Jake Brookman from Coin Fund, just giving you an overview of how these two mega industries will intersect. And one of the companies that is working at the cutting edge between AI and crypto is Giza. Now, Giza is a project combining AI and Web3 in a way that makes a lot of sense to me because it's a machine learning platform that's built on StarkNet and it's focusing on deployment scaling and solving deployment barriers that are very common with Web2 services. So don't worry, we're going to dive into how all of that works, what that all means. And with me today are Cem and Fran from Giza on the show. So welcome to the show, guys. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you. So just to get us started here, can you maybe tell us a little bit about how you guys decided to build Giza and then we can maybe jump into what Giza actually is? I can give you some context on how we started working on this. Last year on March, I discovered all the, the space about rollups and ZK rollups, uh, specifically StarNet, and found the technology that is being used underneath, in this case, uh, CQ proof, specifically Starks, super fascinating in terms of uh, performance capabilities, but also how it enables scalability for the blockchain. And I thought that this technology could enable like a bunch of new applications to be built on top of this case Ethereum. And that's where I started to like, uh, look into this intersection of ML and blockchain by using their uh, smart contract language that is not only a smart contract language, it's called like Cairo. So it's like a mix of things that you can use for general purpose, but also for building smart contracts. And I found that this language is like the perfect combination for building uh, machine learning models that can be also smart contracts. And I went to East Amsterdam last year and participated in the special StarNet hackathon that happened there and build uh, what it was the first POC of what is Giza now and build like a super small model that can be deployed as a, a smart contract. And uh, people were, uh, were like blown away. Like, wow, this is actually possible to run models on chain. And I was like, yeah, uh, I think it is. And since then, like, uh, here we are basically. <laughs> Yeah, and anything to add there, Chen? I think the following events sort of like took us a little bit towards thinking around how to turn this incredible capabilities of 
not only smart contract machine learning, but also verifiable machine learning, which is, you know, has implications that is uh, a little bit, I mean, much wider than uh, just Web3. So we started thinking around how to turn this into a product, how to turn this into a protocol. Yeah, since then, sort of like a lot of our efforts have been directed towards this thinking, the deliberation around mechanism design of this uh, protocol. But we can dive deeper uh, in the conversation. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Because what you guys are working on with Giza is uh, being able to deploy these machine learning models on chain. So I'd love to dive into that kind of value proposition. Why is it important to be able to deploy it on chain? Like what, what, what about the current uh, way of doing things is insufficient? Yeah, super good question. Uh, I will say the main point here is if you want to use AI in the blockchain, do you need to rely on the usage of oracles? And if you need to rely on the usage of oracles, that means that you need to have an AI model deploy somewhere off chain. For example, in a cloud service where your model is in a micro service serving inferences. And then these inferences are being served to the oracle where the smart contract consumes these inferences through the record. But then like you have then like uh, different pain points, like for example, what happens if your uh, model market service goes down? What happens to your smart contract? Basically you're like uh, in pants, like uh, you, you have no way to recover from that problem, right? Unless your macro service go, goes back up again. Or what happens if there is a consensus problem in the Oracle and your inference is not well received into the smart contract? So there are like several risks and this basically makes you the usage of AI not viable or feasible in, in the usage of protocols. For example, in DeFi, you, you won't make a DeFi protocol that relies on this kind of uh, architecture because it will put uh, in risk the funds of your users, basically. So now the, the thing is, with this new way of doing things, deploying ML models completely on chain as a smart contracts, you have the possibility of not rely on any of these architectures, not oracles or microservice deployed off chain, but have everything living on chain and just plug in directly into your protocol, the model as a simple smart contract call to make the inference, which makes things much simpler and composable basically. And just to tie this into more concrete terms, what are some use cases that would require this uh, this utility? Like, what what are the things that we can do as users uh, with Giza, uh, where you bring these kind of AI models on chain? Well, basically, you can make any use case that you want, but going to specific of use cases, I would say the more interesting ones are in the DeFi space, where, for example, now if you want to have like some complex, uh, for example, yield strategy or asset management, you need to completely build this complex logic into the smart contract, which can be not very straightforward, will require a lot of uh, auditing around it. And this kind of behavior is like, uh, for example, for optimizing the yield, uh, is a super simple model that, for example, many fintech companies in Web2 uses. But in Web3, it's not possible, right? Because you need to build this arcane architecture to make it possible with all the overhead of auditing. But now, instead of all, uh, adding all these overheads, you could just use a model and get the yield optimized result much more easily. Maybe I can add that um, as a general sort of a pattern that I've been uh, noticing with all the use cases that we have been exploring uh, and also engaging with uh, the partners that we have accumulated so far. Um, I think like one major pattern is that wherever there is a, a complex set of variables that needs to be uh, boiled down to a, either a decision or a, a singular parameter that is easier to analyze, you know, you can think of uh, reputation algorithms, you can think of credit scores, um, we are unable to accommodate these with the current deterministic smart contracts that uh, cannot reach this, first of all, level of computation, but also indeterministic analysis. So any, any problem that has this type of complex set of parameters, it's uh, a, a intelligent intelligence layer is probably helpful for uh, creating that efficiency on chain. Um, so you can add 
social choice problems to that as well, right? Like, so um, it links perfectly to this like re reputation algorithms case, like reputation algorithms only work if it's uh, fine tuned to a particular needs of a community. You cannot really like apply one uh, community's uh, algorithms to another. And that reparameterization is also a very difficult problem because you have decentralized governance. So decentralized governance, parameterizing a complex set of parameters, it becomes computationally almost impossible. So if you have a layer which understands the needs of the needs and uh, desires of the community and translates that into uh, parameterizing the reputation algorithm, then you can have one layer that can fit many communities' needs, generatively speaking. Um, so I think like this is a general pattern that I'm noticing with uh, the use cases that ML is able to serve on chain. Yeah, and I guess taking a step back here as well, I think from our previous episode with Jake from CoinFun, I think our listeners learned that for these AI models, there's, I'm oversimplifying, but there's mostly three parts. You create the model, you train the model by feeding it a ton of data, and then there's the inference part where you give it some new input and it's supposed to give you uh, an output predicted by the model. So for Giza, are you moving, you know, all all three of these parts, you know, the construction of the model, the training and the inference on chain, or are you only moving certain parts on chain? What's the best way to understand that? Yeah, we're heavily focused on the inference side. Uh, so we let people do the training whenever they want. Uh, they can do it on their uh, laptop, train their model there, or in the cloud, AWS, Google Cloud, whatever it is. We let people freely choose what they want to build. And not only that, but also using the framework they like, like they could use TensorFlow or PyTorch or Scikit-Learn, whatever. And once they have like their model file uh, with the train model, that's where like GISA comes in with uh, the platform side of GISA. And people just uh, upload their model into our model registry in the platform. And that's where like things start to to happen in terms of uh, managing the models, deploying the MS smart contracts. And that's where like we manage everything from the monitoring to the deployment and the scalability. Also, one thing that's important to note is that deploying these models on chain is a choice in Giza. So like we don't actually monolithically deploy models on chain. We also allow for this uh, uh, other use case, which is uh, the ability to run more complex models that uh, the current on-chain constraints don't accommodate today, but actually generate these inferences with the proof and the trace of its computation from the machine learning model. And then this becomes some kind of a defensibility against the Oracle problem uh, where you, know, you are unsure if the Oracle is like uh, reporting correctly, uh, but you can actually check the proof on the verifier that is living on uh, the desired chain, uh, for, for instance, Ethereum or whatever chain that implements the verifier for Sharp, which is the prover that we are using today. Also to add, I think this is something very unique that you are working on on GSA is because of leveraging these technologies that we are using from Starware. And in this case, it's, as I was mentioning at the beginning, using Cairo, we can have these models both as a smart contrast but, and also as uh, single programs, which means we can deploy them as a smart contrast, but also we can do this kind of behavior that Jim just described. That is, we run the inferences off chain in a microservice, we generate the traces for these executions because the models are in Cairo, and we can verify completely on chain these inferences that were, were correct. So it's like a lot of flexibility and options to make this verifiable model inferences be available on chain. Yeah, and I think one really important thing that you mentioned earlier, Fran, is that uh, you're able to deploy these models on chain, but uh, avoid the avoid kind of writing extremely complicated models directly onto the blockchain itself. And I always thought it was interesting because blockchains are resource constrained by definition. You have to pay for block space and so on, whereas AI requires the opposite. It requires as much resources as possible to train, to do these inferences. So can you maybe explain in simple terms, how are you able to deploy these models on chain without running into set of capacity issues as these models get more complicated? That's a super good question. And before doing into the specifics, uh, also like give you a bit of context of what we are trying to deploy on chain. And because uh, 
there are like different complexities on the model set that uh, are available in terms of ML. Like you have simple algorithms like regression or super complex algorithms like uh, GPT-4, right? So in terms of on-chain models, uh, we are more focused on the simplicity and high value algorithms, which means everything that is going to be on chain are like uh, regression algorithms, decision trees, boosting algorithms, algorithms that are like super cheap to execute, can be run on CPU personally, and can provide a lot of value to different uh, use cases. So in terms of uh, deployment, we are focused on that. So on one sense, we don't need to run super expensive transactions and we don't need to store uh, like weight into the chain itself to avoid this uh, storage cost. Because also like one of the benefits of using our infrastructure for deploying models on chain is that we are using the Starnet, which basically the main benefit is that the computation costs are super cheap, which means we can run the inferences for these simple models as smart contracts with a very low transaction cost. So yeah, so Fred, so when can we expect to see neural networks on chain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super good question, actually. Um, we are now working on improving the the tech stack that we are using underneath for deploying the models. Two days ago, we released our new library that is called Orion. Orion is basically a new library built in Cairo, in the new version of Cairo, Cairo Land, where we provide the building block for building these new complexities of models like neural networks in an efficient way to be deployed in this case on chain. So you can imagine like we are building this new set of blocks like uh, uh, tensors, uh, functionalities that is basically how neural networks, the, the primitives that neural networks use underneath using efficient uh, Cairo computations so they can be run on chain. Now, also, like the cost of deploying these, these smart contracts has been decreased over time as the technology of the Starnet also improved. So now it's, it's almost possible to deploy these neural networks. We are almost ready to, to be able to deploy neural networks. Oh, wow. And I, I'd love to understand just how big of an impact this can have on all of crypto. So I guess using the examples of like well-known projects, um, you know, what, what are some ways that Giza can improve the utility of maybe some examples of well-known projects? I'm sure you guys have thought about, hey, how can we plug Giza into like Uniswap or how do we plug Giza into like Axie Infinity? Like what are some interesting ideas that you guys had? We are working in different verticals with different use cases. Uh, for example, in the DeFi space, uh, we are working with some OG projects, uh, DeFi 1.0, uh, where we are like working on risk assessment for strategies of vaults, where basically instead of people of this protocol need to do the manual risk for these studies to be included into the into the vault. Now it's uh, going to be an automated process that is going to be handled by a model that is on chain and is directly connected to the protocol, which means uh, there is no dependency on the person. We can automate the process and we can have like better scalability also for, for providing better usability for the users. And for other kind of verticals, for example, another one that is super interesting right now is on-chain gaming. Uh, it's getting a lot of attention lately. And uh, we've seen we've seen like a lot of uh, demand from from this area in terms of how to enrich the gaming experience for these on-chain games. And as all the logic and everything that is happening in the game is put on the chain, you can have uh, things that are like uh, very native to games like NPCs, uh, non-playable characters. So this is something that, for example, if you play uh, GTA or any kind of game, you can play against your the computer and do a race or do whatever, right? But for on-chain games, this is not the case, and you need to rely on something that is on-chain to have this kind of behavior, because now that these on-chain games relate heavily on on-chain usage, you can have it. 
So we are like working on providing NPC agents to these on-chain games where people can add these non-playable characters plug into the game to be able to accommodate this necessity of having a bigger user base when there is no one playing the game or not any enough uh, user base playing it. Yeah, I think like this this is a really interesting use case because uh, uh, like I'm kind of ideologically opposed to play to earn <laughs> because of uh, oh. sort of the inherent like class dynamics that emerge from that in like uh, uh, the ludic economy. Uh, and I think this is like a much better compromise to like create game conviviality uh, for player experience than uh, paying people to like spend time in an environment where it's not fun for them to, to do so. Um, uh, but yeah, I think uh, different use cases that I could talk about, which is interesting, is like, you know, civil resistance, I think uh, is really relevant for uh, a lot of different projects for different reasons. So proof of humanity type of use cases uh, are things that we are exploring closely. This is more of a research, but uh, we are exploring how we can contribute with on-chain machine learning to decentralize arbitration? How can we help scale and improve the game theoretic uh, effectiveness of distributed uh, decentralized arbitration and court systems and increase their usage? And th there we are thinking around both like integrating decentralized arbitration to regulate on-chain AI, using on-chain AI to uh, assist uh, decentralized arbitration, and then uh, also hybrid court systems where humans and uh, ML inference uh, work in uh, collaborate cooperation for uh, more high value decision making. But in, in this sense, like there's the, the use cases are so abundant that it's kind of like, uh, you know, not to equate ourselves to Vitalik, but it's kind of like asking in Ethereum's early days, what are the use cases of smart contracts? Because uh, what we're doing is like just expanding the capabilities of uh, smart contracts. So this is going to be really up to the ecosystem to see where they can take this, actually. So it's kind of like a project that is nerd sniping the whole ecosystem as to, you know, <laughs> okay, how, how do you like um, use these new capabilities and um, yeah, improve uh, on-chain mechanisms? I always thought this was very interesting because I remember in 2017 or so, I was watching a YouTube video with Vitalik and he basically said that the most interesting use cases are things that we haven't even heard of yet uh, or I haven't yeah. even thought of yet. And to me at that time, I, I was uh, studying business. So for me, that sounded like crazy to me because every time you invest in a business, you want to know the exact business model. You want to know the problem they're solving. But then when you look back at all the big innovations, all the big zero to one moments in crypto so far, it's things that no one pr basically predicted. It's always these new unlocks of just completely new paradigms. Um, so I'm really excited to see kind of what people can build with Giza. But I'd love to kind of double click on one thing you mentioned, Jam, which is uh, proof of humanity. Uh, what exactly is that? So proof of humanity is uh, a, a way to authenticate that uh, a certain on-chain identity belongs to a single person. And that person cannot generate in the same environment or in the same protocol another account uh, which you know becomes relevant for many different use cases um, but the one that is kind of i would say it being most applied to is um, ubi systems right like so ubi is a, a universal basic income which is kind of like a utopian economic model which is very much uh, in, in discourse uh, at the moment because of uh, sort of fears of automation and like people losing their jobs. So there's like this desire to find new alternative economic systems where people can sustain themselves with like a minimum income that is like coming from a certain source of economic productivity. But for these systems to work, it is uh, uh, you know very crucial that there is no hyperinflation of the beneficiaries, right? Of the, of the recipients. If there is uh, no check in terms of who can subscribe to this, then you can actually farm this you know, welfare system by generating uh, infinite amount of bots uh, and basically crashing and hyperinflating the token that is being uh, minted towards the rightful users. So that's where you know, proof of humanity is like extremely crucial. And we know of uh, you know, a couple of projects in the Web3 ecosystem, uh, namely uh, Circles UBI, that is... Um, uh, comrades from Berlin, 
and also uh, WorldCoin that are also like both of them working. Basically, like they are effectively proof of humanity protocols. You know, the only thing they have to figure out is to make sure that they authenticate that one person is one wallet and then UBI could work. Of course, then like you have to figure out how to sustain that economic circularity and where is the productivity coming from to make that sustainable. But um, proof of humanity is basically the way to um, authenticate that one user uh, is controlling one wallet. And for context here, I think for WorldCoin, they just announced a raise, I think, $115 million. And for context for our listeners, WorldCoin basically has this device that scans your eyeballs and creates an on-chain identity for you based on an eyeball, which is supposedly you know, very hard to, or almost impossible to Sybil. You can't create a fake eyeball and and, and you know create fake addresses. And it, it's always interesting to me because that company is partially started by Sam Altman, who is one of the founders for OpenAI. So he's almost starting a company to solve a problem that's created by his other company, which is this <laughs> proliferation of AI. So I'm actually curious, uh, you know, how does proof of humanity tie into AI here? Like, how does that uh, t- tie into deploying AI models on chain? So right now, we're relying on systems like Web of Trust, which is allowing for people to sign each other's wallets, kind of like in uh, Tor, um, so authenticate each other's wallets in a social manner by uh, PGP signatures, this type of thing. Uh, and Circles is, for instance, using uh, this type of uh, network algorithm, communication protocol for authenticating humanness. You need at least three signatures to be part of, uh, to, to be a recipient of the UBI token, uh, while uh, Worldcoin is going the biometrics direction for uh, authentication. So there's like different epistemological data sources that we can use in order to sense make uniqueness of, of uh, or humanness of a certain account. And this is not limited to biometrics and it's not limited to social, but it's actually uh, we can have machine learning analyze all of these uh, different data sources and give a decision in the end. Again, like what I was mentioning earlier, a complex set of parameters and one uh, output in the end. This is where machine learning becomes very useful. So this is what we are working on uh, with uh, Circles, with our friends at Gnosis, to see how can we turn wallet history, how can we turn uh, submissions of a a photo proof or a video proof into uh, proof of humanity without any type of human oversight or overhead uh, so that these systems can become much more scalable and uh, context-free for deployment. For me, also, there is another use case that is super interesting um, that we should explore as well is how to actually improve the user experience for wallets. And one of the biggest pain points here is how do you actually recover a wallet, right? You need a C phrase. Now there is the social recovery part as well. But what if uh, you can link your identity to your wallet in terms of your, for example, uh, your fingerprint identification or your facial recognition, uh, leveraging account abstraction, that is something super prominent now uh, in Altus, for example. And link this identity to your account so you can, instead of doing this key recovery or social recovery, you could use your actual identity directly plug into the uh, account wallet to recover uh, basically your, your wallet, like uh, using facial recognition or fingerprint recognition. I think that's a very interesting use case as well that will come. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about kind of potential ways you can apply these models to consumer facing use cases. One part of Giza we haven't talked about is the open source nature of it. The fact that you're deploying these models on chain for all to see, which might imply that other engineers who want to improve the model can easily contribute to improving these models in an open source environment. How does that differ, first of all, from how current AI models that are not on chain are built? And why is that important? I think your focus is on open source right now. What we want to really cover is people building in open source, how these people actively contributing to open source can actually empower actually what is happening on Web3 as well. 
And this is one of the main purposes. But the second thing is how we can actually provide the right word wire trails for people to build in the open using open source, but being governed by what is happening in the Web3 space. Yeah, I mean, uh, our main intention was, you know, as you well put it, Jason, like it's a kind of seems like an impossible uh, romance between uh, AI and Web3, uh, but we are, uh, you know, obsessed about bringing them together because uh, there is this like ideo- Web3 provides this like ideological infrastructural capabilities for coordination. So what that means for AI is that we already see this in like uh, the open source of uh, like in a hugging face, for example, in open source uh, AI, where there is a kind of supercharged movement in terms of creating derivatives, building on top of existing models, etc. So we want to take that to another level by making these systems composable, but also these systems as primitives that can be replicated with almost no cost and deployed in settings which the the founders uh, of a of, or the builders initial builders did not intend to so i think that this is the power ecosystemic or ecological even uh, power of web3 that we are very excited to bring to the world of ai um, and of course there is like uh, one thing that is kind of the elephant in the room that uh, web3 did to open source which is uh, making open source you know quote unquote sustainable in the sense that putting assetization, digit, digital uh, tokenization uh, into the mix and allowing for this economy to persist, right? Like, so uh, open source obviously has a much longer history than Web3, but Web3 took it to uh, such an interesting level where, you know, um, I think contributed significantly to uh, incredible innovation, uh, e- even in things like cryptography and zero knowledge and so on. So um, I think, we can take this type of energy to AI and uh, uh, provide an alternative way of uh, developing AI. So if people don't feel aligned with, uh, you know, uh, tech giants, uh, if they don't want, if they are machine learning engineers and inventors and they don't want to work in Silicon Valley, maybe they should have an alternative path of doing that independently. So I think uh, with um, Giza, that's going to be possible in the near future. And I think that's a great note to kind of pivot to zoom out a little bit and really talk about the market environment that Giza is in, in terms of the timing of building something like Giza, because it seems like AI has been the top of mind for at least a small group of people for many, many, many years. But it seems like only recently did it hit mainstream with the launch of ChatGPT and everybody started to have a more visceral understanding of what even a relatively simple model uh, can do. So I guess I'd love to get your view on where you think we are in terms of the entire life cycle of AI. You know, are we on, 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 on the very beginning of the development? You know, what are some things that get you guys excited in terms of, you know, the, the maturity of the AI market? In terms of maturity, mm, the AI market has been like for a while uh, around. The thing is that it's just hit mainstream, but for example, for enterprise, uh, ML has been being used like for a long time for a specific many different use cases. But now it's like uh, millions of people can have uh, instant access to a super powerful AI model that is in this case LLMs and how they can actually improve their lives or their work they are doing. And I think this is going to move forward very quickly. We've seen like uh, the speed of development from GPT-3 or GPT-2 to now GPT-4, and the difference in quality of the output is like uh, uh, quite remarkable. And how this evolves over time uh, is is going to be, uh, I think, faster, in, not in terms of how models evolve, but in terms of the applications that are going to be made uh, on top of these models. This, uh, I think this actually the, the leverage that is going to happen in the next five years. I think in general with uh, industry, um, you know, scale comes first, like scale comes first and dominates and creates kind of the, the space, which is exactly what we're seeing in AI, right? Like, you know, the data compute, like these are all subject to like extreme power laws. So it allows for, you know, 
gigantic uh, corporations or alliances to deliver cutting edge consumer experiences. But I think like what follows after this like scale carves the the, the space. Uh, what follows after is interconnectivity and the, the, the effects that that brings about. So like we can think of computer manufacturing versus the internet as, as, as a similar sort of like one is subject to extreme amount of uh, uh, power laws, the other interconnectivity and the interconnectivity provides such a ground for innovation that then it creates such a uh, ecosystem of uh, new technology. And this is like, we can think about like Bell Labs not being able to capture all the innovation that is creating in a similar manner. Uh, so I think this is coming to AI. And I, I think like um, infrastructures or ecosystems such as Giza is going to, um, you know, facilitate a lot of this new movement from scale to interconnectivity and uh, learning transfers. And the other movement that I'm anticipating is, so right now, AI, I think, is a bit of a sandbox, even though it's like in everyone's laptop or everyone's phone. It's still limited to a very you know, normative experience of uh, a, a chat exchange. While, you know, if you listen to Sam Altman or any other uh, thought leader in AI, everyone is talking about, you know, how this is going to be transformative, life extending and, uh, you, know, um, you know, sort of utopian in many different ways. And that is predicated on AI's application to very critical sectors that are uh, like medicine, like finance, like law, like uh, defense. Like, so there, there's all these uh, verticals that are waiting for adoption that is not going to get this adoption unless there is uh, some kind of regulation, right? Like no, no government is going to let AI sort of crash through these industries without uh, regulating them. So AI is going to take a new turn where verifiable machine learning is going to be the key to enable the regulation of uh, machine learning in all these high value use cases. Because the, the ability to uh, establish a link of accountability between a model and its output, which is literally what uh, verifiable ML does, that is going to be the key that unlocks uh, the expansion of AI from uh, the limited consumer experience to a uh, wide range of adoption and invention in uh, many different high value industries. So I think like one is the ecologization of AI and the other is verifiability of AI. I see these trends as uh, most exciting for sort of spreading the real utility of AI to the world because many people who don't have access to the, the benefits are going to be able to benefit from it. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that breakdown, Cham. I think that that's a great way to kind of summarize the two big confluence of kind of um, tailwinds that are coming for AI. And I'd love to kind of use this part to shift away and talk about takeaways for listeners here. So if you know our listeners are building projects or they want to learn about how, how, they, how can they integrate AI into their crypto businesses, you know, how should they get started with the journey with Giza? To start the journey with Giza is actually uh, pretty straightforward because we don't let anyone out for using uh, what we are building. So basically anyone that is building ML models at the moment using any kind of framework is going to be welcome to use Giza and to use these models on chain or in a verifiable way. So the best way to contribute, for example, for uh, the moment is be helping us building the foundations of what is now Orion and how we can extend the functionalities of this runtime to uh, have better support and performance for bigger models that can be run completely on chain. I will echo what Fran said there. Like um, the the best way to uh, get into this field, I, I would say, is to contribute because uh, it's literally getting acclimated to a new uh, smart contract language, a new set of capabilities of doing machine learning on chain with that smart contract language. I, I also want to say it's not only a smart contract language; it's also like uh, you know a, a provable language. So it's not a it, language for creating provable programs. So it, you don't have to exclusively write smart contracts necessarily. 
Uh, so the best way to be involved in this ecosystem, I would say, is to contribute. And there's two ways that people can contribute. One is to the core infrastructure to increase the capabilities of Orion. So uh, helping us out with bringing Orion to completion, uh, where new operators can be uh, contributed to our uh, repository. But also, if you are more on the entrepreneurial side of uh, um you know, AI Web3 development, then you can think about use cases and how uh, these use cases can uh, tangibly function with the constraints that are uh, present right now. And uh, you can, we will also have hackathons throughout the years uh, where people can come together and, uh, you know, uh, tackle different tr tracks and explore different use cases. But also we have a type form in our website where we grant a whitelist for uh, deploying on Giza uh, before we, uh, you know, permissionlessly deploy on uh, on the mainnet. Um, so if you have a great idea, feel free to uh, reach us out either in our Discord or uh, through the type form. I would say best way to uh, is best, best way to be involved is to contribute. Perfect. I think that's a perfect note to kind of wrap this up on. So we'll include those in the show notes below. And gentlemen, this has been a really interesting episode. I do think this is the cutting edge of crypto that not enough people are paying attention to yet. Um, so we're doing our best to yeah, illuminate that that sector and educate people as well. So really thankful for you guys for being a part of that. Um, and what are your Twitter handles or what are the best way for people to follow you as a final shout out? Well, Giza Tech. XYZ is uh, the um, handle of Giza. Got XYZ. So you guys heard it here. Go and check out the Twitter. Uh, there's some pretty great blog posts explaining what Giza, uh, what Giza does. I um, highly recommend you guys to check it out as well. So thanks again for coming on, Fran and Jam. It's been a delight. It was a pleasure, Jason. It's been a pleasure, Jason. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the Block Range Podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite apps. And in case you didn't know, this interview is also available as a video on YouTube. And if you tag the Block Range on Twitter this week and tell us what you liked about this episode, I'll be sure to respond to you as well. Now, if you'd like to go even deeper, we have a VIP tier where every week or so, we write an in-depth research brief or investment memo on a project. And we'll have exclusive AMAs with myself where I answer all your questions as well. Now, we already have analysts from some of the top funds and companies in crypto as subscribers. So if you're serious about getting an edge in crypto, head on over to theblockcrunch.com slash VIP to learn more. And once again, thanks for supporting the show and I'll see you next week.